Trading futures and options on futures involves substantial risk of loss and is not suitable for all traders and investors. Oftentimes in futures trading, you have a high combination of leverage and volatility. And although this could be an equation for opportunity, it's also an equation for risk. So be careful, only fund your futures trading account with risk capital. My personal definition of risk capital is money I could afford to lose doesn't change my lifestyle or overly stress me out. As human beings, we make bad decisions when we're under stress, so be in a good spot. Remember, micro contracts could be friends. Take it easy on the day trade margins. You get plenty of leverage without maxing out on those day trade margins on a regular basis. We'll be taking a look at a real-time simulated live Ninja Trader trading platform today, and none of this should be construed as trade or investment advice. Past performance not indicative of future. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to See the Futures. My name is Jim Cagnino with Ninja Trader. It's November 2nd, 2023. The day after the second to the last FOMC meeting, which didn't seem like it was going to amount to much, but it sure has moved prices across all the asset classes. But perfect timing, though, to join me the day after for this event, Blue Putnam, uh, the chief economist of the CME Group. Blue, good morning or afternoon. Oh, good to see you, Jim. It's great to be here. Yeah, no, absolutely. And your timing, this is, a, this is a great timing for a show because, you know, just when you think that uh, you understand what the reaction of the markets are going to be based on a major event, you have no idea. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, so it's pa Paul, you know, let's start with Paul's press conference yesterday. You know, it just seems to me that some of these quotes, let me read you a few quotes, were pretty hawkish. You know, there's a long way to go to get to 2%. We're committed to achieving this efficient restrictive stance. We are not confident policy is sufficiently restrictive. Let me read that one again. We are not confident policy is uh, sufficiently restrictive. All this stuff seems incredibly what I would call hawkish. Yeah, I mean, he wanted to, he was trying to deliver a hawkish pause. But the market heard the word pause, and he's done this hawkish pause story a couple of times, you know. So uh, you're getting diminishing returns. Uh, but, you know, he also said that uh, we're not confident <clears throat> policy is sufficiently restrictive, but he wasn't confident it was it might be restrictive enough. I mean, he he kind of moved to a more balanced stance in the nuances, uh, you know, and, and F Fed funds are significantly above the uh, inflation rate that we're seeing. Um the, the yield curve still inverted. I mean, you know, policy's restrictive. I mean, that, that's what it is. So what's the best best measure right now? If you had to take one snapshot of what, what the true inflation is right now, we have a lot of different measures versus the Fed funds. <laughs> that's a trick question. First <laughs> off, <laughs> things like the CPI. The CPI has that thing called owner equivalent rent. It's 25% of the CPI, and it's an imaginary number, okay? It doesn't exist. And guess what? I didn't really even understand this. They, t they put it in the CPI, but they add owner equivalent rent to GMP. There's money you don't even have. You're renting to yourself. I'm not paying myself for my house. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm in it for the long run. So I can't use the CPI. Okay, so the, the core CPI, I mean, the... Uh, the uh, personal consumption, that has it in it too, but not as much. It's a little better indicator. Uh, I don't care if you take out food or energy or not, because I'm going to smooth it over a couple of months. So the volatile things get smoothed out in my goal. And then I look at the components. So durable goods, no inflation there. That's all disappeared. Discretionary goods, almost all disappeared. Services, the only real thing that's still going up is rent. And that's a lag number because I don't renegotiate my rent every month. If I did rent, uh, I sign a year or two lease. So it takes a while, but it's coming down. So what's the true inflation number? I actually think it's between two and two and a half. That puts us close. Puts us close, close to target. Counts in horseshoes and hand grenades, but I don't know. Uh <laughs> You know, I, I really don't think we're going to have a 10-year period at 2%. I think it'd be more like two and a half to three. But, hey, we're not that good. You know, I'm, I'm a big figure guy. Don't I, I don't try to do decimal points. That's a mistake. 
No, I, I, I got you. Well, let, let's kind of then add to the, let's add a little fuel to the fire here with these bond yields, right? The discussion about how now bond yields are going to act is another kind of interest rate hike, so to speak, with, you know, the tra- they, they've been hot, right? Yeah, the, the link there is uh, is through the mortgage market or basically anything you have to borrow money to buy. So, you know, initially when mortgage rates went up, as they went up, those people who were lucky enough to buy a house in the last 12, 13 years, they got 3% mortgages. They're not going to sell. <laughs> and so if you wanted to buy a house, you had to get it from new construction. But at 7 8% mortgages, that's going to hit new construction too. Uh, so we are going to have some lag slowdown in housing. And it'll probably hit the automobile market as well. Anything you borrow money for is going to be have a headwind in, in 2024. I got it. And, you know, one of the things that really kind of surprised me yesterday and then again today was the 30-year bond and the 10-year note rallied significantly. Now, they've been in a bear market, I don't care what anyone says, for a long period of time. And it kind of raised some eyebrows here. Is this kind of a, is this a, the future? Have we changed direction or just a temporary just rally? Well, we... There's a pretty decent probability that 5% on the 10-year and the 30-year was the peak for at least this cycle. Um, To to go above that, you really need to make a case that inflation is going to rise again, come back up toward 4, 5, 6%. That is an exceedingly hard case to make. Everything that caused the inflation in the in the pandemic, the five trillion of fiscal stimulus, the five trillion of quantitative easing, the supply chains, all of those have been fixed. They're all gone. So to make a case that inflation is going to have some major resurgence is is you can make the case, but I, I don't buy it. It's it's difficult. So you've got a situation where if you are believe you're at the Fed peak of for Fed funds. Uh, typically bonds and equities can rally off by finally getting to the peak. And that's what we're seeing. Uh, the rally will, will be short-lived, but, but the rally, the, it may last longer in terms of a, a much slower pace, uh, particularly so, in equities. Um, fixed income, is there's, there's limits, but uh, equities can continue to go up, but just in a slow, volatile way. Yeah, and the other well, but the other part that I've noticed the the te- so looking at the CME groups uh, yield right, looking at the CME groups uh, micro yield contracts, the um, inversion between the two and the ten, they were getting close to being on you know on parity. Last couple of days, they kind of spiked up a little bit to about twenty eight basis points, with the ten year leading the leading the parade down faster. Yeah, I really feel for the yield curve traders um, because, you know, they were they were slow to figure out how fast interest rates would rise. And then they thought, well, we'll automatically get a recession because we got higher interest rates. Instead, we didn't get a recession. So that allowed the longer term yield to rise. So we had a flattening of the curve for all the wrong reasons. I mean, for these traders. And now it's going back the other way. I, I think we have to come to a realization that the Fed's pretty serious about higher for longer. Forget about whether they're going to raise rates one more time or not or whatever. But, you know, unless we have a pretty serious recession, they want to stay where they are because they want to make sure we're down to 2% on inflation and stay there. And I think that's going to be very hard to, you know, get 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 your hands around. So in that kind of situation, trading the yield curve has been a, let's just say it's been a stressful thing to do in the last 18 months. Yeah, no, for sure. And, you know, the Fed funds tool now is tracking uh, the first rate cut not, uh, you know, in June of next year, June 12th of 2024, according to the Fed funds tool. So that's, that's, that's longer. Yes. And typically both when we commence a rate rise cycle and when we commence a rate cut, the Fed funds futures underestimate how far up and how far down at the initial stage. Eventually they get it, but it, but not initially. So, uh, you know, if we actually get cuts, they may turn out to be more than the futures market says right now, but that would also imply uh, probably a not so good economy. 
Got it. Okay. Well, I'm keeping track of that thing every day. I have it on refresh, refresh, refresh. You know, now we're tracking a 20% chance of a rate hike in December, 80% unchanged. You know, that number is going to change a little bit as more data comes in. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I look at it to predominantly to, to see, you know, when when is the, the futures market timing the rate cut? Um by the way, as you probably well know, uh, economists should never talk about timing and direction in the same sentence because you're going to get one of them wrong. And uh, the futures market shares that with economists. So so we'll see. Yeah, no, I know. Sometimes I get them both wrong. But <laughs> <laughs> um, so the other thing that struck me today, we had that four week bill auction today. Routine, right? They have them all the time. You know, it's tracking a 5.29 percent yield. And a bid co- co- cover ratio of almost three at two point nine one, that's pretty strong. It is, and uh, you know, I talk to a lot of people in the um, managed endowments and pension funds and things like that. And well, not all of them, but many of them feel like, uh, well, you know, cash used to be zero. Cash was trash. Well, cash is no longer trash. You can uh, lock in your five percent for a year or two. You can increase the quality of your fixed income portfolio, a little more investment grade than you had. Uh, And you can have you can actually de-risk a little bit and get the same return you were trying to get a couple of years ago with zero rates. But you were searching for yield everywhere. Uh, So there's a lot of demand for uh, for cash. Yeah, and that's interesting with the, you know, really with the competition in the equity market, right? There's, there's a competition. Where are we going to get, where's the alpha at? You know, where are the money managers going to be put, you know, allocating resources to? When you, so you still have that little bit of a conflict where a lot of that cash is not going into the equity markets. Right. It's just, oh, yeah. The, the, when you look at all the cash and say, wow, that's dry powder, that's not dry powder, that's a portfolio hedge. These people are, you know, hey, we got geopolitics coming out the years. We still haven't really come out of the pandemic totally yet. I mean, we have in terms of a health, but not in terms of economic adjustments. Um, being a little conservative right now, uh, a lot of people are doing that. And cash is a way to do it. Yeah. And maybe Markovich is smiling with this kind of diversification on our portfolios. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure he is. I'm sure he is. Uh, the other thing that... Uh, you know, uh, Harry, Harry was very strong about was the uh, you measure things in excess returns. So if you thought you could make 15 percent in equities when the cash rate was zero, that was a 15 percent excess return over cash. Now, maybe you've lowered your equity return from 15 to 12 and cash is now five. So you're only dealing with a 7 percent excess return for cash. Uh, that tells you you trim your positions a little bit and have a little more cash, which is you know, kind of what's happening in, in at least some portfolios. And if you believe the treasury story, you have less risk. Uh, yes, right. <laughs> anyway, um, so let's kind of talk about it. You mentioned it earlier uh, when we started uh, this uh, idea of quantitative tightening versus quantitative easing. We're, quantita- we're tightening now. And the last time I checked, we, from an asset point of view at the FO, at the Fed, we went from 5.7 trillion in 2022 to about 4.9 trillion now. So that's quite a, a, a big redu- reduction. Yeah, I mean, we've knocked a trillion dollars off the asset uh, securities portfolio of, of the Fed. Now, of course, uh, during the pandemic, they added 5 trillion in about the same time, same length of time it's taken them to knock 1 trillion off. So the quantitative tightening is moving at about 20% of the pace of the uh, quantitative easing did. Moreover, quantitative easing was active buying, which which has its own impact. And quantitative tightening is mostly letting securities run off. They're not really selling much. So uh, it, it's a very asymmetric process. I think the Fed has to be pretty happy with the quantitative tightening because it's really not the story. Every now and then a few people talk about it, but they don't want it to be the story. They want it to come off gradually enough not to be. And I, I think they're uh, they're talking about continuing it for a long time. It, it's a success story from their point of view. But it's but I th- it, it, there's a difference between that and um, what Congress spends, right? And future spending <laughs> in Congress. That's a whole different thing, right? 
Oh yeah. In fact, a lot of people get that one a little confused. We we a lot of analysts focus on the budget deficit. And they see the widening of the budget deficit. And some people might even call that a loose fiscal policy because the budget deficit is bigger. Well, the budget deficit is predominantly rising because guess what? Interest expenses going up. You're taking those 0%, 1% securities and you're refinancing them at 4 and 5%. You know, that's going to, or five, you know, it's going to go up. So it's the fastest rising component in the budget. I track cons federal government spending. That's all I really care about when I'm looking at inflation and an impact on the economy. Uh, and, you know, spending went up for the pandemic. It's gone up a little this year with spending on Ukraine and uh, the infrastructure bill. But when you look over the next 10 years, spending growth is going to be very flat. It might go up a little, but not much. So my definition is based on government spending, we're going to be in a decade of tight fiscal policy. If you look at the budget deficit, you may use different words, but I think that'll you'll be misled. Yeah, I got it. And so I, I, I'll i admit, I was confused between the two for a long period of time until I, until I kind of figured it out. So there are two different things, two, two moving parts going on at the same time there. So we'll keep our eye on what happens out of the Hill the next, uh, see if we'll have, you know, are we going to have another, are we going to have a continuing resolution again or, or not? That's the, well, the, the uh, you know, predicting Washington politics is even harder than talking about the economy. But, uh, you know, it, it looks like there's a lot of momentum to do a continuing resolution on November 17, sometime around 11 p.m. that night. Uh, cause they always wait to the last minute, but then when they do it, it'll take us somewhere in the next year. And that's where the risk gets really high that uh, in the middle of the primary season with everybody positioning that you just might, the, the odds on a government shutdown are, are fairly low for December, no guys for early 2024. And, and so Let's let's say we have a government shutdown and it lasts a couple of weeks. I don't know how long it will last. I was a federal employee. I loved it when it happened because I knew I was going to get back pay. So it was like an extra vacation. But I'll set that aside for a second. How much impact will that have on on the economy as a general matter? If it only goes two or three weeks, it's going to be hard to spot in hindsight. Um if it starts going longer than a month, particularly four, five, six weeks, then it's a headwind for the economy because that's a long time to go. For. There are a lot of federal government workers that are in the lower paid zone and, you know, they got a little bit of a cushion. But when you're talking about a month, six weeks, then then you're starting to affect expenditure. So, But you're right. The initial reaction is to go to Lowe's and Home Depot and fix up your house because you, you don't have to go to work and you know you're going to get the money. Um, but but as that drags out, it's not so good. So there's kind of an inflection point right around the one month where it really starts to to bite the economy. Got it. Well, let, let's um, let's talk about Friday. We have um, non-farm payroll after last month's crazy three hundred and thirty six thousand <laughs> number, which it's got to be revised down a lot. And that's, that's the only thing I'm thinking. But what the heck happened there? I don't know what happened there, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of mean reversion in these numbers. So it's kind of a duh forecast to say it's going to definitely be a smaller number uh, for this one that comes out Friday. But, you know, strikes complicate this thing. We had the UAW strike. Now, striking workers don't get unemployment. But if you are uh, if you're working in a factory that gets shut down because of another striking factory, maybe you're building parts and mm -hmm. so on, then you can get unemployment insurance. So I've been, you know, I, I track the uh, unemployment, initial unemployment claims, and they haven't been doing anything particularly unusual. So I'm going to go with your thing that this is just going to be mean reverting. It's going to drop back down, maybe some revisions, and we'll see. But uh uh, I, you know, that 336 can't last. That's for sure. We're not creating that many new workers. Uh, you know, labor participation is rising a little, but not that much. Well, the unemployment rate was 3.8 percent, just the headline unemployment rate. And then we saw on the on the uh, on the jobs numbers today. Was it today? Uh, you know, the four week moving average is slowly creeping up, you know, slowly creeping above that 210 level. Yeah, it's just creeping very slow. And 210 is not a particularly magic number. 
you know, what you're really looking for if you're worried about a recession is you're worried about that number just jumping up, um, you know, and it, it, within uh, four or five weeks going up 20, 30, 40, 50,000 uh, and then headed toward 300. And then that tells you, you know, you, you just got the email, the recession started. Uh, but moving from 210 to 220 to back to 210 to 230, we can handle that. So if I remember my old textbooks, and correct me if I'm wrong, we when you had a situation where it was strong productivity, which I think we saw yesterday in that number, a couple with a strong jobs market, that's usually what we see coming out of a recession. And we haven't been out of, you know, coming out of a recession for a while. Yeah, but we're coming out of the pandemic. So I think we got a little bit mm. of uh, pandemic recovery in these things. I. I have uh, I've never been able to really figure out productivity numbers. <laughs> they're 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 hard to dissect. Yeah, and they're all over the map. Exactly. Um, so let's pivot a little bit internationally here. We have, you know, the Jake Bank of Japan um, comes out comes out with these announcements that boggle my mind. They 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 say stuff like, "Hey, we plan to exit from easy monetary policy next year." <laughs> I was like, "What?" <laughs> That doesn't. That's not helpful. What does that mean? It means next year they might go from minus zero point one percent on their short rates to plus ten basis points. <laughs> you know, and they 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 did ease up a little bit on what they call their yield yield curve control policy YCC, <clears throat> and uh, that allowed Japanese bond yields to rise just a touch. But then the next day they went in and bought some of the things. One of the you know, Japan has a very large culture, particularly in their pension funds and things like that, of owning a, a big chunk of fixed income. So when these rates rise, they're, they're you know, they're, they're losses in those portfolios. So the Bank of Japan definitely wants to take this slowly and more slowly than the Federal Reserve doesn't feel like it has that same kind of constraint. But then how it but that how does this those kind of subtle changes affect their investment in US treasuries? Um, it probably means a slightly smaller investment in US treasuries. But I will tell you that the number isn't going to be big enough. You're not going to see it. It's not going to be why treasuries move. And part of that's also that there is an an, a Japanese yen currency effect going on here. They made the yield curve adjustment, but that's, long rates don't determine currencies. That's wrong in my view. It's really short-term interest rate differentials and the growth potential of the economy and the riskiness. And on the short-term interest rate differentials, they're going to stay really wide versus the U.S. I mean, even if they raise rates to 1%, which it's going to take them a while to do that, They'd still be, uh, you know, four and a half percent less than U.S. So uh, the the yen stays under pressure here. We're we're at a one fifty round number on the currency. Round numbers that become important are uh, always dangerous. So we bounce through it. We go back. We bounce through it. We go back. But uh, you know, if if they're as slow as they're telling us they're going to be on raising rates, then the one fifty probably doesn't hold over the you know period. Uh, and, and so if that's not holding, then, you know, maybe they will have to sell a little more of their treasuries to defend the currency. But I, I can't see it. I don't think you'll know, notice it in the treasury market. OK, well, that's interesting. You know, and, the, and, and just and just uh, let everybody know you're talking about that 150 number. That's kind of that's kind of the typical currency uh, pair cross in the cash market at the CME group. They have great C, uh, currency futures where it's, you have way more advantage trading those than over the counter, in my opinion. And they, it's an inverse relationship with the yen on, as the numerator and the U.S. dollar at the denominator. You have a few more decimal points to deal with, but that's not hard. Yeah, I can't do that math. Yeah, no, I know. It's easier to quote 150 <laughs> than it is the 0.0073521. <laughs> it's just not as interesting. But right, you're right. Exactly. The uh, the yen futures are a good way to take a look at this. Yeah, for sure. And we're super fans of that, uh, for sure. While we're talking international, though, we had the Bank of England. And this was interesting because not, they, they were unched on their benchmark, unchanged on their benchmark uh, lending rates. But it was a six to three vote. Yes. Um, the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee doesn't have kind of the consensus attitude of the Fed. 
you know, when the Fed does something, even when it's controversial, you almost never get more than one dissent. If you get two, that's a huge deal. But that's because they kind of sit down in the meeting and designate a particular, you're going to be my designated dissenter this month. <laughs> you know, they don't do that in the UK. If they, if they don't like it, they just tell you. So the 6-3 is real, it's controversial, and, uh, you know, there's definitely a possibility they could go higher down the road. Yeah, and I'm interpreting this as, you know, we have a strong chairman. You know, Chair Powell is, uh, is relatively strong, yeah, but we are rolling off four voting members after next month, and we have four new ones rolling in, bank presidents, starting in January. Now, I wonder if his job becomes a little harder getting, you know, a quail in the goats. Oh, uh, a little bit maybe, but all all of the region, all twelve regional Fed presidents sit in every meeting, and they all go around the room and have their turn to say things. And there's a great deal of mutual respect. So the the change in the voting uh, can be subtly make it a little bit softer, a little bit hawkish more. But it's it's actually fairly small because of the way they conduct the meeting. Jay Powell has to corral all twelve all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, it's on my bucket list, Blue, to be in the corner of an FOMC meeting, just to, just to observe. You know, I won't even ask to share in the chocolate donuts or whatever they bring out, just to listen, <laughs> because you got you probably have some great staff presentations also. Oh, yeah. You know, they bring their staff to the meeting and uh, give them a nice grilling and so forth. But, uh, you know, it's it's a relatively congenial meeting uh, as these things go. So we have one intern, interim president, I think it's San Francisco. Her last name is PZ, I think. Is that a temporary thing or does she eventually get forwarded to some nominating committee? How does that work? Um, I don't know whether it's temporary or not. The, uh, the Federal Reserve regional banks have their own boards. Um, but there's an interrelationship with with Jay Powell and with the Fed governor. So uh, I'm a little out of the loop on how that would work. They just seem to pop out and get, uh, you know, some, somehow or another a consensus develops. So I can't okay. I, I can't talk to that one. OK, because she's 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 going live at 630 this afternoon somewhere. You know, the first of what's <laughs> going to become Fed Palooza week next week where they all come out <laughs> yes. and start talking. So that'll be that'll be a lot of fun. That'll cause some volatility in some of these great markets. Yes, it will. So let me this. We're almost out of time, but I do want to run. You know, this this. I'm still a little bit surprised at the strength of this equity rally that we're seeing right now, and I'm wondering how much of this is because it's November and it's seasonal, or just a direct impact on Chair Paul. Actually, you're correct to cite the seasonals. Uh, equities do tend to finish okay, and then they do fairly well early in the year. And then, as they say in the UK, sell in May and go away. Uh, September is typically the worst equity month of the year. October is typically the most volatile. They both lived up to that. So I do think there's some seasonal relief uh, coming at that with the idea that maybe we're at a peak on the Fed. So that gets Jay Powell in place. So a little bit of both. Um, but the equity market I think, you know, if you take the long term view with Fed funds above the inflation rate for a very long period of time into the future, if the higher longer holds, you know, corporate earnings are not going to grow as fast. Equities can still go up, but they're going to be, a, you know, a little noisy on the way up. It's not going to be the decade of zero rates when, when you know, when capital was free. <laughs> that's a big push for equities. That's gone, but they'll still go up. So there was some relief. There's some seasonals and there's some this, you know, the bonds are rallying. So the equity's got to like it. Yeah. And interesting, kind of related, you know, you look at the um, the Fed funds tool again and, and it's kind of projecting the biggest chance of a rate increase is going to be in January. I think it's the 13th or 15th. I can't remember the date, uh, but and I'm thinking about how portfolios, you know, how we, we have tax harvesting in December. And then folks liquidate or add positions the first or second week in, uh, and I'm talking money managers in January. Mm -hmm. And will that is, you know, will that have an effect on the FOMC meeting at, at the time based on where the equity prices are because of all of those shenanigans? 
I don't think so, but but you're right to point those out. They were very big last year because 2022, people had tons of losses that they were not used to. And so there was a lot of tax harvesting going on that disturbed the equities right there at the end of the year and beginning. Uh, this year, I don't think it'll be quite so disturbing, but I, I, I don't sense that that's a big number for the Fed. They they're 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 totally uh, focused on unemployment uh, first and inflation second, or vice versa. Got it. All right. Well, we're up against time, Blue. I really appreciate your time today. I've all, I've learned a lot as I always do when I'm talking to you. We're looking forward to having you back on the show at the next FOMC. That sounds good. Yes, mid December. Fourteenth, thirteenth is yeah. the day. Yeah. All right. Well, in the meantime, you have a great week um, and I'll be talking to you soon. Everybody, thanks for coming today to the show. Appreciate everybody being here. Most important message of the day, please be safe out there. Be good to each other. See you soon.